This is the SAU Report, a program featuring interviews with the faculty, staff, students, and alumni of Southern Arkansas University in Magnolia. Hi, welcome to this edition of the SAU Report. I'm Joe Scott. And I'm Wade Phillips. And today we're going to be talking to Dr. Donald Watt, a professor of uh, geography and political science here at SAU, and he's also the coordinator of the Russian Exchange Program. Welcome to the show, Dr. Watt. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the uh, Exchange Program and how did, how did it get started here at SAU? The Russian Exchange Program has been in operation for six years. It started when one of our history professors, who has now retired, Professor David Sixby, was visiting at uh, UCA, University of Central Arkansas. He met a Russian professor who was temporarily on campus up at UCA, and they became friends, talked about the possibilities, and from that, the exchange program developed. Uh, it's between Southern Arkansas University and Moscow State Pedagogical University, which, of course, is in uh, Moscow. Okay. Okay. Uh, when, I, you're going over there uh, soon, right? I mean... Uh, Right, I'll be going over there in the fall. I'll, I'll leave here at the end of August and spend three months teaching at Moscow State Pedagogical University. Uh, I'll be teaching American studies, cultural values, a little bit of our political systems, geography, and so forth. You, uh, you just said you'll be teaching American cultural studies. Uh, how will uh, it change your teaching style, or how would you prepare to adjust to this? I'll have a couple of different opportunities to teach over there. In their educational system at the university level, they have what are called groups, uh, groups of 10 to 15 students who do all their classwork together the entire time they're in the university. And so part of my time, I'll be working with several of these groups. I'll spend two or three weeks with each group uh, talking about our culture, some of the differences between Russian and American culture. And then there will also be some lectures where uh, essentially all the fourth year or fifth year English majors, there's about 120 in each of those groups, uh, we'll gather together and then I will give a, a formal lecture on some particular aspect of U.S. culture or our geography or politics. Uh, how, how would you be paid? Will the university here be paying you? Or will you? Yes, the, uh, the only way it's possible is to have Southern Arkansas University pay uh, the professor that goes over there on the exchange program. Uh, professor, uh, President Gamble has made arrangements and funds uh, an adjunct to teach three of the four courses I would normally teach in the fall, uh, and I'll be teaching an extra course in the spring to make up my uh, contractual obligations. Uh, while I'm over there, uh, I will be receiving a room in the International Students Dormitory, and then they will pay me what is a salary for a professor, but right now that amounts to less than $50 a month. Uh, that's all that their professors are currently getting paid because of the uh, financial problems. Okay. Will your family be joining you? And uh... Uh, No, we had discussed whether or not my wife would go with me, and she uh, has decided to remain here in, in Magnolia. Uh, my children are both uh, university, so they're, they're okay. going to be continuing their studies, so I'll be uh, living by myself. <laughs> well, um, what are some of the things that uh, bother you about leaving here at SAU? And well, there'll be lots of changes, you know, some opportunities as well as some difficulties. Uh, just the difference in culture, the difference in tradition, and the lack of funds for the university over there means that technology that we take for granted will not be available to me. You know, copy machines, uh, professors do not have individual offices, uh, uh, only the deans and vice president and presidents have computers. The uh, professors, unless they have one at home, do not have access to a computer. So the things such as that, which will make teaching a little bit different. Uh, also, of course, uh, in their culture, the transpor transportation, lifestyle is much different. Uh, more people have cars than was the case 10 years ago, but still most of the people do not. And so you do a lot more walking, which is something maybe we should do uh, as Americans. <laughs> Uh, so there's a lot more walking involved. Uh, we have very small refrigerators. I'll have a small refrigerator and then have access to a communal kitchen. Uh, so food preparation will be a little bit different. Uh, where you buy the food, most of it is available in open air markets. Uh, and so that limits, at least from my perspective, the meat in the open air market I probably won't buy. 
there are a few grocery stores that are more expensive. I'll, I'll do things like that, but uh, all these make differences. Uh, the water system in Moscow is no longer approved for drinking, and so it means you have to buy your water and, and carry it back to the, to the dorm to drink. So there's, there's a lot of inconveniences, but it's worth the, the challenge and the excitement of, of getting to uh, know more about Moscow, the Russian culture, and, and working with some excellent students at the university. That sounds sound very interesting to me. Well, uh, do you speak Russian? Uh, and if so, how many phrases and things <laughs> do you use to... I speak a little Russian. I, I know enough to bumble my way through... Uh, uh, conversations to find my way around the city. I'm hoping to improve substantially while I'm over there. Uh, I was there during early June and watched some of the television, or tried to watch some of the television, uh, and in Moscow, uh, they had just traditional style TV, and I could understand part of the news reports. Obviously, the pictures help. Uh, in other, other shows, I really didn't understand what was going on. Uh, the grammar, Russian grammar is difficult, and that I don't have down, but one of my uh, friends, a professor who's been over there, told me, uh, everybody knows you're not Russian, uh, so just bumble your way, uh, find the right words, don't worry about the tense or the, or the case, and they'll figure out what you're trying to say. <laughs> so, uh, in the event that teaching uh, grammar wouldn't really have much to do with the students there? Uh, as far as uh, my teaching, I'm working with fourth and fifth year English majors mainly, and so the teaching responsibilities are in English because once they uh, get past the uh, second year, uh, all the English courses are totally in English. Uh, and so that won't, my lack of Russian won't affect things in that sense. It's more just my everyday life, trying to buy food at the market, uh, although pointing helps out there. Uh, the numbers are the same so that you can figure out the cost. And, uh, It'll go well, I'm sure. Okay. okay. Well, uh, how does college life for for a student? How does that differ from like it would over here? Uh, college life is much different because relatively few of them live on campus. Most uh, university students, college students, commute, uh, so that's one difference. Uh, the second difference, which is changing somewhat, is that before uh, five years ago, everybody who was admitted to the university had to do so uh, through competitive exams. Uh, the Moscow State Pedagogical University was ranked the third best university in Russia uh, in the 1994 study. And so of 100 students who would try to get into that university, uh, only 9 or 10 would be admitted. And now with financial problems, they've been uh, given permission to admit up to 10-15% uh, of their students as private pay students who are uh, maybe not able to pass the competitive exams but who have $3,000 a year that the university needs. Uh, so uh, it's uh, much more uh, competitive to be in the university. Again, they don't have any electives. When you go, you have to know what you're going to major in the first day you come on campus and you are then locked into that track for the four-year, five-year uh, program that you may have entered. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, you do have this support group, this dozen or so students who are with you all the time. Uh, they support one another. Uh, traditionally, in their socialist mindset, that meant helping one another on exams, which would not be permitted in the United States. Uh, but they did cooperate and build very strong bonds among this dozen or so students who you, know, you would spend four or five years every day studying and working together. Um, you were talking about the criteria they have to meet to be accepted to college. What kind of criteria do uh, Russian students have to, to meet to be able to come over here in, in the Russian program, the Russian exchange program? In the exchange program, we have scholarships for two students each semester from Moscow State Pedagogical University. Uh, they're usually either third or fourth year students who have excelled in their classes. Uh, the faculty of the uh, the English faculty get together and debate some of its uh, faculty politics as far as whose favorite student might get to come, uh, but they, they choose from among their best. And so uh, the decision is made there in Moscow, and we've had no problem. All their students who've come over here have been very fluent in English. Many of them speak uh, or understand English better than many of uh, our American students because they've studied it uh, so hard and, and uh, worked on it so that uh, that's the criteria. It's up to them, and um, it has worked very well these first six years. 
How uh, does this program uh, benefit uh, SAU? Uh, it benefits in a variety of ways. The first five years of the program was just people coming from Moscow to here. Uh, beginning this last year, we had uh, Dr. Herzog, who was the first exchange pro uh, professor to go from here. I'll be the second. And each year, we will have one of our professors go over there and experience life in Moscow. Uh, for the Magnolia community, for Southern Arkansas University, uh, we have programs that are uh, for the public on Monday evenings, usually six Monday evenings when our visiting professor is here, we have public lectures on life in Russia. And these have uh, been on a wide variety of subjects, everything from uh, Russian architecture to how people just get by on uh, very limited incomes in a difficult situation. Uh, the students who are here every semester are available to uh, civic groups, church groups, whoever might want to invite them to uh, talk about life in Russia, talk about their experiences. Uh, and so we would encourage people to, and groups to do this. Uh, the students bring a strong work ethic with them. Uh, they are a good example to our students and uh, the faculty have found them uh, very uh, uh, pleasant in their classes and a good experience to, to uh, get this new perspective on, on education and also what it means, uh, what life is like in the United States versus uh, their home in, in Moscow or in Russia. So there's no charge for the public to attend these lectures? No, the, the Monday evening lectures are open to the public free of charge. And uh, if they contact me or contact uh, somebody working in the exchange program, we'll you know, uh, provide the students or the professor to the various civic groups, uh, again, free of charge uh, to try to help them understand what, is, what life is like for them. OK, now, I understand that uh, we, we exchange professors and Russian students come over here. Is there any plans in the future for sending American students uh, over to Moscow? What we've done so far on a very limited basis is to have some summer trips available to students. Our biggest problem is very few SAU students want to learn Russian. <laughs> and without knowing the language, unless they were going to study in the English department, uh, there'd be no way for the students to do uh, you know, do well in classes if you don't speak the language. Uh, so what we've tried to do is uh, every summer, or every other summer, make available a, a two or three week trip to Moscow to show them some of the sites, to uh, meet the people at the university, to learn a little more about Russian culture. Uh, if students would want to learn Russian and go over there, that could be worked into the program. When a professor leave here to go over in Russia to do the exchange program, uh, how long will they stay and why? Uh, it's usually for just under three months. Uh, when their professors come here, we compress classes so that rather than meeting three hours a week, it meets four and a half hours a week so that their professor is done in 10 or 11 weeks and thus can get home uh, quicker to see their family and, and get back to the normal schedule. The same thing over there, uh, rather than being there the full semester, it's uh, usually just under three months, again, uh, 10 to 12 weeks. Uh, so that the professor can get back here to his or her family and uh, back to their regular responsibilities. Uh, in their uh, system, it, uh, it works out well. Uh, most of their classes, uh, are based, uh, their grades are based on an oral exam at the end of the semester. And so uh, when our professors won't be there for those exams, but they, other people will know what, uh, what has been taught in the courses and, and be able to grade the students. Uh, here we just have an early final and if people take Russian or a class from a Russian professor, they just get done with one class early in November rather than December. Well, what is the uh, academic standard for a Russian student to stay in college? What's the academic standards? Yes. Uh, it, it still remains very difficult. Uh, uh, like I say, the, the getting in is still competitive. Uh, even some of the private pay students, or even the private pay students have to meet uh, certain standards. It's not just open to anybody with, with the money. Uh, there's still uh, some competition among there for the spots that are allocated to the, to the paying students. Uh, and so it's, it's still very competitive. Education is still highly valued in Russian culture. And it is one point which is uh, still keeping them uh, very strong in, in the world today and giving them hope for the future. Now you have been to Russia before. Right, I was there correct. two years ago and I've been, I was there just uh, two weeks ago. And what kind of paperwork would, would someone have to, to get ready to, to go over there and visas and 
passports, things like that. Uh, Russia, Russia is still a somewhat closed society. Even though the communism is gone, there's still very strict control. So to be able to go to Russia, you have to have a formal invitation from a group. Or if you want to go as a tourist, of course, you can get an invitation from the Russian uh, government's tourist agency, uh, always, of course, for a fee. Uh, so you have to have a visa. Uh, it does take usually, it depends how much you want to pay, how fast it gets done. Uh, it takes usually two to four weeks to get the visa processed. Uh, then when you go over there, uh, it takes usually about an hour to get through the airport. You have to go through one place where uh, they look at your visa. It's, it's sort of a, a glass cubicle with a bright light outside so you can't see who's inside and they're uh, looking at you and what they do is usually take about three minutes, look at you, look at your visa picture, look at your passport picture and do that several times then usually of course stamp it and let you through. Uh, then you have customs as far as you know, checking whether you're bringing illegal things into the country as, as all countries have. Uh, and a few other procedures, but uh, it's, uh, it's much more difficult to go to Russia than um, virtually any other European country. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the, the culture over there, uh, like food, for instance. Uh, what kind of foods do they have that are different than what we eat over here? Okay. If you're an American tourist, of course, you can always go to McDonald's if you're in Moscow because they've got lots of them now. Uh, foods that are different, they don't eat as much beef as we do because traditionally they've not had as many cattle. Uh, they eat more fish. Uh, one thing, the first time I was over that surprised me was more raw fish. Uh, of course, we know about caviar and so forth, but I had not expected for them to serve the uh, amount of raw fish that they serve in Moscow and, and throughout much of Russia. Uh, they eat many salads. Uh, if you're a Russian chef, I think you probably spend six hours a day chopping vegetables because uh, their salads tend to be uh, you know, mixed vegetables all, all chopped. And, you know, they don't serve any of the vegetables whole. They, just, they chop, it seems like, everything. Uh, so lots of salads. Uh, when you're at a formal dinner or even just a, uh, a visitor such as I, uh, a little more formal than their average dinner, uh, they have uh, two or three courses and like to have lots of conversation, lots of uh, uh, time at the dinner table. And so you would start with uh, juice. Uh, if you drink alcohol, you, usually there's wines and vodkas and a variety of alcohols there. Uh, you start with breads and, and raw fish and things such as this. And then the main course would uh, be you know, some type of meat, usually a chicken or, or something such as this. Uh, and then uh, some vegetables and then a variety of, of desserts as well. Uh, so it's, it takes getting used to it. Uh, a cuisine, I think you would uh, would grow on you after a time. Uh, it's not the traditional American fare. Right. What what type of crime uh, are they are they high in crime or? Uh, That's one of their problems. In the Soviet society, everything was so repressed. Crime didn't didn't exist to any great extent because uh, you know they were under surveillance for everything, and so it would be hard for criminal activity. Uh, since that time, with more freedoms, there has come a larger crime problem, although most of it tends to be uh, what we would call white-collar white -collar crime, uh, things such as this. In, in Moscow, you know, walking the streets of Moscow, I never felt threatened. Uh, you know, I, I've been uh, visited Los Angeles quite a bit, and uh, uh, Moscow was a safer, sa safer than what I would feel in yeah. Los Angeles in different areas. Uh, so, you know, street crime is still very rare. Um, part of that could be because uh, guns are very restricted, uh, you know, weapons, so weapons are not available to criminals. Uh, but uh, theft, white collar crime has become a growing problem. You were talking about in the past how uh, under communism, how they were su under surveillance and things. How, do, how does their new, new freedom differ from ours, or is it basically the same? How does that? It, it differs to a certain extent because uh, of the history of, uh, you know, like say, the surveillance, checkpoints. Uh, in Russia today, there's still a variety of checkpoints. So when you drive on the beltway around <coughs> Moscow, uh, every few kilometers, there's a checkpoint there which could be closed. They don't close them very rarely, but there's still a police in the checkpoint watching people go by. Uh, same thing when you go on the roads outside of town before every village, uh, on the outskirts of every village, there's still are police checkpoints, things such as this. 
so they're used to a stronger police presence, and that's different from what we would find acceptable today. Uh, the, the freedoms are growing. Uh, you know, religious freedom is there. The, the Orthodox Church has tried to keep its preeminent position, uh, but overall the government has cooperated with religious groups in terms of uh, religious freedoms. Uh, freedom to demonstrate, freedom of speech is fairly well accepted. Uh, and so they're slowly working towards what we might call American standards, but, uh, but the repression for a number of decades uh, has kept them from uh, moving the same direction we have. Okay. What, what kind of media, what's the media like? I mean, uh, is the media as hard on the government as there with their freedom of speech? You know, are they allowed to be as, watch the government as closely as our media does? They can be, uh, but one difference is that much of the media there is owned at least partially by the government. And so when your owner is doing something, you're not necessarily going to be as tough on them as uh, independent media. There are some independent, tele independent television stations and radios uh, who are uh, hard on the government. Uh, the government there, however, can limit media access to a great, greater extent than ours uh, because, again, of their, their traditions, if they... Uh, one uh, TV or newspaper gets too far out of line as far as what the government's concerned, uh, they just won't give those reporters access to the government officials, and that uh, limits the freedom of the press to a certain extent. But, but they do not confiscate papers or, or say you, you can't broadcast this. You mentioned religion. Uh, how, how did their religion differ from ours over here? Well, traditionally, Russian society was predominantly Orthodox Christian. Uh, this uh, is different from the Western Church in that in the, in the fourth century we you had the split between the Western Church and the, the Latin Church and the Greek Church and from that time they sort of evolved in, in different directions. So the Orthodox Church is very strong in Russia probably uh, more than 90 percent of the people who say they are Christians are members or see themselves as members of the Orthodox Church. Uh, relatively few Protestants, few Catholics. There are Jewish, uh, you know, a large Jewish community, Islam, some Buddhist in Siberia and so forth. Uh, religion is growing very rapidly now that communism has ended, uh, but they're still trying to, to feel their way and exactly what does freedom of religion mean uh, and what path different people should take. Okay. Um, about religion and, and, and morality, how, how does their morality you know, I know in Europe they have a different view of uh, the way we, we do. Uh, what's morality like in Russia? Right, I mean, Russia uh, is European in many respects, although when you get to Moscow and east of Moscow, then you have Asian influence as well. So it's a, uh, a very mixed society. Uh, you know, their uh, view of morality is different from ours uh, in that uh, I'm not sure what you would talk about, but in terms of things like the use of alcohol right. in the United States, that's a big issue. It's, some of, it's a, an issue in, in Russia, but just because of the abuses. Uh, like say, where I was living this, uh, this summer, there was a construction site next to it, and at 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, some of the construction workers would stop by the neighborhood store and buy some alcohol to take to the construction site to drink on the job, which in the United right. States would, yeah. would not be acceptable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like I say, morality, the, you know, the friends are, the people are good, uh, but under the communist system, they sort of got this ethic that cheating on the government, uh, uh, bending rules was the way you did things because that was the only way to exist under the communist. And so today there's, there's lots of people who try to bend corners. Uh, one of the things they've started is, is two-tier pricing. One price, like at museums, for Russian citizens because they don't have much money, and one for foreigners. And when I'd go with Russian friends to some of the museums, some of them would try to pay the Russian price for me, just uh, not because we didn't have the money, but just because that's the way you did things. You, you tried to, to cheat the government. You tried to uh, get around these, these higher fees, these higher, uh, uh, higher uh, costs to the foreigners. Well, Dr. Watt, it's been very interesting. I, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, it's been very interesting, and we've enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks for watching.
The SAU Report is a production of broadcast journalism students in the Department of Theater and Mass Communication at Southern Arkansas University in Magnolia.